Well, I see people are coming on board now. Um, we've got uh, 33 people on board. I hope the rest aren't at the Guns N' Roses concert that Max is going to mention later on. But welcome, everyone. Um, tell us where you're from. Hi, Alan, uh, from the UK. Very nice to see you online uh, again. Thank you, Alan. And uh, everyone else, uh, please let us know where you're from. And I see Patrice is on, online. Thanks, Patrice. I'm really glad you got the link. Um, because we do see that, that Zoom does sometimes have a problem sending links through. It goes into junk folders, et cetera. So uh, please just watch out for your Zoom link. But on, on the calendar invite, when you are registering, you'll see there that there is a, um, you know, you are able to download, download a, ca a calendar entry for your calendar. And in there, you can always email us. Uh, there is a link to email us if you have a problem. So hi, Joanne. Hi, Bapit. Uh, Babita, Babita, thank you. Very nice to see you online. Um, you'll see that we have uh, available the uh, reactions at the bottom of your screen. If you can see your, your uh, console, if you like something that Max is saying today, uh, give him a clap, um, give him a high five, uh, give him a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, your uh, reactions are there. Um, let us know where you are from the ch in the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, if you can put them in the Q&A so we can distinguish the, um, the questions from the chat that's going on. But please feel free to, to chat, um, put your comments in the chat box. Um, let us know how, how you uh, are finding the webinar and perhaps even what you would like to see next, um, something of, of interest that you'd like us to host a webinar um, and bring some speakers on, online for that. So thanks very much, everyone, for joining us. I see that we are on time now. Uh, it is one minute past, so I'm not going to take any further um, time of your time, and I just want to introduce you to Max. Max does have uh, Franchito. Franchito. How do you say your surname, Max? Franchito, actually. It's, Franchito. it's a CH is, 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 is solid, not a soft CH. So it's ah, Franchito. Okay. Oh, Franchito. Well, very nice yeah. to have you online. And I know you. that you've got a little bit of an in introduction um, to yourself, but we are going to have a discussion later on. But if you can just give us a bit of background in the beginning, that would be wonderful. And then tell us all about the course that we've recently endorsed. Thank you. Okay. All right. A little bit of background about myself. Um, I um, graduated as an economist and um, went on to work in financial services here in Australia. Uh, spent 17 years, 18 years doing the corporate thing um, and unfortunately became disillusioned at, uh, at about the age of 40, 41 uh, and thought I'd be better at going out and doing my own thing. So I became a consultant while living in Sydney, which was where I was recruited to. And a few years after starting my consultancy, I moved back to South Australia uh, which is abbreviated as SA. So sometimes um, uh, people think that I'm from uh, South Africa, but nonetheless, um, South Australia and, uh, and developed a business consultancy, which was predominantly just business consulting. Uh, I then went on to thinking that uh, uh, I should do some work in the not-for-profit sector. So I joined a not-for-profit organisation, uh, became chairman, uh, was chairman for six years and then... Uh, uh, my term was up, so I had to move on. And uh, somebody asked me, what are you going to do with your spare time? And I thought, that's interesting, not that I have a lot of spare time. I thought, but one thing I noticed that in the not-for-profit sector, there's a lack of um, real understanding about the duties um, that directors should have, regardless of whether you're not-for-profit or commercial. And I don't know about in your country, but in here in, South, in Australia, we tend to be a little too lighthearted, not to use a harsher expression, on uh, about sitting on not in on not for profit boards. Um, so um, I thought there's there's a gap, there's an opportunity there to educate people on the importance of uh, being a director per se, but also the importance of being a good director in a not for profit environment where the obligations are exactly the same, the duties and responsibilities, and the fiduciary duty sometimes is even stronger, especially if you're uh, involved with not for profits um, in the human services space, like. Um, uh, children or uh, or elderly, um, there is some serious uh, uh, 
uh, decisions to be made and the clients you have depend on those for their very lives. Uh, so that's where I've come from. I then went on after my economist qualifications, I went on to get an MBA. I went on to get a, a law qualification because I thought governance needed to have some legal uh, background. Um, so I've been a student. Um, I think my last degree was in 2012. So I stopped studying 10 years ago. Um, so, but I've been studying uh, since uh, 1979. So, and governance is one of those subjects. I don't know about those of you in the audience who are uh, involved on boards. That, um, it's it's a never-ending learning curve uh, for governance. And I often um, have a bit of a, uh, a dig at directors who say they've done the uh, director's course with XYZ organisation in 2001 and they're all good to go. Um, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Um, so that's my background. So that's why... I've come to this realisation. I've been consulting to boards now since I launched Build Your Board in uh, July 2010. So uh, I am really um, involved in, uh, in, in the board work that I do at the moment. Uh, most of my work is around board reviews and board professional development. I do some mentoring with chairs and uh, and uh, some directors um, on a ad hoc basis, on a casual basis, uh, and I meet with them either via Zoom or in person um, uh, regularly uh, to mentor them, and, and, and that's an arrangement that we have which works well. Uh, so um, that's been my focus. So Build Your Board has now taken up 90% of my time, and I've probably I've dedicated 10% of my time to general strategy consulting. Uh, so here I am. Uh, I've always believed that you need to blend work with lifestyle. Uh, so two things happened as a result of COVID. One, um, I lost a bit of the lifestyle. And two, I had occasion to do some work on uh, um, the collection of my thoughts on uh, good governance. And without wishing to... Um, uh, upset the Good Governance Academy, I launched uh, inadvertently um, the Good Governance Handbook, which is really a little uh, a little manual uh, that um, uh, I recommend to directors to have on their desktop um, so that if they ever have questions around uh, the basics of good governance and want to flick through and see what I say about it, that it's readily available. It's nowhere near as... Uh, as elaborate as um, uh, Bob Tricker's latest uh, little uh, gem, but um, it goes somewhere towards uh, collecting thoughts that are important. Um, so um, that's what it's all about. The rest of me you can read about on LinkedIn or you can Google me um, and that'll be fine. Uh, I think we should get on with what the course is all about. Now, why did I design the course? I designed the course because I wanted to reach as many people as possible. I think I'm a, one of those believers that you have to have an impact um, of some sort uh, in, in your occupation, in your in your uh, chosen vocation. And for me, uh, it's making a difference in boardrooms. And I said, well, you know, two thirds of the world um, all work under a similar governance framework to that of the Westminster model, which is what Australia is under. And those of you in the UK uh, fathered uh, that, that particular model. So we're part of the Commonwealth and South Africa is the same. Um, so at the end of the day, I thought, well, I can do this globally. You know, um, with COVID, we learned to, to um, uh, work globally, so why not? So here I am um, doing a couple of things. I'll tell you a little bit about my other little lifestyle masterclass, which um, I know I have some people from the UK coming to join, so hopefully uh, I'll see them there. But um, this is more of a an opportunity for me to speak to international directors about their duties and responsibilities. So let's get on with it. It's, it's a really basic um, program. Um, it's a program designed uh, around five sessions, uh, approximately 90 minutes to 120 minutes, depending on how the conversation goes. Um, it is based on the Harvard um, 
business school learning methodology, which is basically uh, me putting up slides and the cohort of uh, attendees uh, interacting with those slides and discussing issues. Uh, so I'm not here to lecture uh, and just, um, you know, do what I'm doing today, really talking all the time. Uh, I, I run it as I run my classes, uh, which I run at the moment. I, uh, I also I forgot to mention that I teach part-time for Kaplan Business School, which is an international uh, postgraduate school. And many of you would know it, especially those of you in, uh, in South Africa and the UK. So Kaplan, there I teach governance, ethics and sustainability. Uh, so I've modeled my courses around the concept of interactive discussion, not just uh, pure academic lecturing. Um, so that's, this is how it's designed. So as I said earlier, five easy sessions. Uh, the first session is really um, setting a uh, peg in the ground, so to speak, uh, where I, I sit with, with you and, and talk about governance. Uh, both at a global and national context. So when I have international uh, attendees, we like to hear what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, you know, the German model versus the British model versus the Australian model versus the US model versus the South African model. And all of those discussions are really good to get an understanding of the global context vis-a-vis -vis the national context of governance as it sits. Then we, um, we, we have a, the first session is pretty philosophical, I've got to warn you. Uh, the second uh, item on the agenda is what is good governance in the boardroom environment? And this usually leads to a lot of debate. Uh, sometimes I have to call a uh, blow the whistle on this one because uh, uh, people could talk about this for hours and hours on end. So our 90 minutes get used up real quick, just on the second point. What is good governance? Um, that's very, very subjective, uh, unfortunately, uh, to a lot of people. We, we think we know what it is good governance and we read a lot of good books about what is good governance. You know, there's a lot of them around. Um, but unfortunately, um, uh, when it comes to the reality of good governance, um, there are different perceptions. So that's a really interesting um, second point in our session one. So we, we start to set the, the, the peg in the ground, so to speak, and we, we, we start to see how everybody feels, who feels that, you know, who has thoughts uh, that are different from others, and, and we explore those and we challenge each other during that, that uh, discussion. The next bit is also uh, a very philosophical uh, element of session one, and, and that's to, to reach an agreement uh, as the cohort that attends my classes um, on a clear understanding between governance and management, you know, the role of the director and the role of the management suite, or as we call it here in Australia, and I'm sure it's an international um, C-suite, the C-suite, chief executive, Chief Financial Officer, Chief uh, People Officer, Chief IT Officer, the, the, the four or five titles that, you know, the, the one to four employees that run the organisation. Then we start to look at some of the more mechanical uh, elements of governance. And that's in session one, part four, we talk about governance theory. And how does governance theory impact the practical environment? Now, we all know we've all been through education, I'm sure, and we all know that we've started a lot of theoretical models in our undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. And uh, unfortunately, um, when we go and uh, take them, we pick them up with all the love and care we have for them, we walk into the real world and the practical environment gives us uh, a reality check on actually how the theories work. Governance is no different. Uh, governance in my course um, uh, has theories, uh, like it has in, you know, Bob Tricker's uh, uh, book and same with Patrick Dunn and all the famous authors in that space. Uh, but um, I'd like to listen to what has happened in the practical environment. So that's a really interesting uh, end to session one. And that session one that you, you, if you... Uh, decide to attend, um, we'll round off um, the, the task of putting us all on, on, on a, 
on an understanding, not on the same page, because it's it's not necessarily a good idea to all be on the same page, um, but at least an understanding of each other's views and, and the environments that we each come from and how that has influenced um, our different viewpoint. So that's session one. Then you go away and um, you have a, a week or so of, uh, of uh, break from me uh, before session two. During that week, um, I, all I ask is that you do an hour and a half or two hours uh, worth of research and reading. And I usually allocate that at the, edge, at the end of each session. I might um, email you, what I typically do is email you a case study and say to you, tear this apart. Uh, and it's a case study that may be challenging um, one of the issues that we've discussed during the lesson. Um, and I'll give you some readings and some practical uh, tips on, on things to uh, research and so forth. And that then gives you time to do your own reflecting and to go back and, and think about some of the things that were discussed in session one. So that would then, a week later or so, uh, would bring us to session two. Now we start to get a little bit more um, focused. Uh, and so we, we, you know, we come from the helicopter down a few hundred metres and we're a little bit closer to the target. And uh, we, we discuss... Uh, some important aspects of, of governance. First of all, the role of the NED, the non-executive director, um, and what qualities and KPIs are required to, one, help them promote good corporate governance, two, um, uh, safeguard good financial management, three, understand diversity and integrity on, in, on the board, and four, independence as a director. What does it really mean? And this is a really passionate uh, element of mine, independence and diversity, are two elements that I believe that uh, good governance uh, globally needs to really focus on. Uh, I think it's the next most important element after ESG. Um, so that's where I stand. And there you are. This could create a debate just with the audience we've got tonight or today. Actually, it's night here in Adelaide, uh, South Australia. So um, it could create a debate. But I do think that diversity and independence are really key uh, to the role of a non-executive director. Uh, then we point two, we go on to discuss the formulation. You know, there's a lot of theories about how do you put a board together? Do you, you know, ring up the five favourite people that, that you met at your private school or your old university or the people you who are members of your uh, tennis club or golf club? Well, you know, that still happens and we suffer from a little bit of that uh, in, um, in Australia. I call that self-perpetuating boards. You just need three mates to get together and before you know it, you've got nine mates. Um, so we talk about that. We talk about, you know, what is a functional size of a board? I had a client who once said to me that the best size board is the board of one. Uh, <laughs> he said that way I don't get any arguments. Um, and But somewhere between one and 18, which is the biggest board I've ever worked with, um, there's got to be a, an optimal number. And that's aside from what the constitution says you should have, uh, because sometimes even constitutions are poorly written in that voice. But diversity is the next biggest one. I think um, I'll just give you a tip on that. That, that is quite a, 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 a meaty subject to discuss. Uh, we go beyond the obvious diversities. Um, uh, as, a, as a discipline, governance is suffering from diversity in gender. We all know that here in Australia, we've lifted our quota to 30 to 40 percent and government wants 40 percent on most government boards. Uh, but technically speaking, we're still missing the diversity ticket um, or the diversity train, I should say. Uh, the, the problem is that the world has become a global village. And we are doing business with people all over the world, with clients, customers all over the world, no matter what you're doing, whether you're in mining or health or pharmaceuticals or any other uh, product, uh, the, the world has become a village. Therefore, we need diversity in culture, we need diversity in race, we need diversity in understanding um, uh, how business works in those various areas. So this is a really meaty one. 
This is a really meaty one. This session never stays on time. It always goes over the two hours. I can guarantee you that because the next bit is the independent director. So we're back to that old chestnut. Um, you know, what is an independent director? And some pretty strong views in that. And they vary from geography to geography. So um, that's a really interesting discussion that comes out of that. And we get to learn a lot about other jurisdictions and uh, and uh, and how they treat independence and what they treat uh, uh, independence as um, and how it evolves. Um, and then we have a final discussion, which is also another very uh, and this is why this, this session too sometimes goes well over time. Um, and that is uh, how the board formulation impacts organisational performance. So we're now starting to talk about in this session about who do I have on the board that will help impact the organisation in a positive manner? Because obviously we're looking for positive performance. So this goes back to the independence, goes back to diversity, goes back to a whole lot of issues that we discussed earlier in, the, in session two. So this is a real challenge. So this session is probably uh, the most uh, in-depth discussion we have. And as I said, we will go over time um, most times and not. So you go away and you spend another week of rest and then the week after or a fortnight after, depending on how we set it up, uh, I usually like to have no more than a fortnight break between sessions. Uh, you go away and you come back uh, with the research having been done on whatever topic we've chosen to research out of these. And, and sometimes I may allocate in groups, I'll say I want group A to look at board formulation, I'd like group B to go and look at roles and importance of independent directors, and I'd like group C to talk about what are the imperatives in good financial management. So you may break away into groups and you might have a, a little subgroup meeting in between sessions or just uh, work on it yourselves. So... Then when you come back, we go into session three, and this is where um, I talk about the tricker model, which is the conformance versus performance analysis and the role of directors. You're all familiar with that, hopefully. Uh, I haven't got his book here with me because I'm working from my home office today, but I think I've got it in my good governance handbook. If I can just flash it up on the screen. I know you all know which one I'm talking about, but I just want to make sure. There it is, the um, Robert Tricker model. And we discuss the mechanics of that. Now, that might sound very lighthearted, but there are some interesting connotations about uh, when we get down to the, the, to the discussion, the detailed discussion of how much time you should spend in each quadrant, because that leads us to the next item on the list, and that is strategic decision-making. And if you really analyse the tricker model, you will come to the conclusion um, sooner or later that strategic decision making is not one of the strengths of most boards on this planet. Many of board meetings have been wasted going round and round the mulberry bush or round and round the table, so to speak. And um, so this is another really interesting and, and cutting edge discussion. What is strategic decision making? Is it a board skill? Is it an individual skill? Does it have to be a skill that a board sharpens on a regular basis? Is it an assumed skill or is it a skill that they can develop? So there are lots of questions just around that point too. The next biggest challenge in the mechanics of running a board meeting and, and being a, an efficient and effective board is the risk recognition capability of the board, their ability to see COVID-19 coming over the horizon. Now, I often joke with my students in my MBA program that I, I, uh, I actually um, knew that COVID was coming and I advised a couple of boards accordingly. Uh, the, funny, the funny discussion there is that I had a few boards that wanted to talk about, you know, the ridiculous risk. So we 
I remember with one particular board, we joked about everybody having gastro in the same week, right? Right from the, the chief executive right down to the people on the factory floor. Well, guess what? COVID-19 turned out to be almost like that, if not worse. So everybody had to go home, everybody had to work from home, nobody was allowed to come on site in case of you know spreading the virus. Well, gastro is maybe not as, uh, as violent as COVID has been, but the similarity of restrictions of doing business was the same. Had a bit of a chuckle about it until it happened, until COVID happened, and then it became a reality. And I think what it, what it exemplified is that risk recognition and management of risk needs to be a highly fine, defined duty and uh, skill within the board as a process as well. So this becomes a really interesting conversation. And we go through my six phases of risk recognition and management, which I, I speak of, and, um, and, I, uh, and we, we debate those, and, and I put them up as my theory on the six phases, and that becomes a, an almighty debate. And we also discuss some case studies on poor risk management. So then it takes me to the hot potato of today's boardrooms, ESG, ethics, sustainability. So I want to call that double ESG because we've got environment, social and governance, but we've also got ethics and sustainability. And ethics is very important when it comes to ESG. So that becomes a really in-depth argument of do we have the skills on our board to future-proof our organisation? Uh, I think, you know, you've all read the book Stewards. Of, I hope that you've all had a chance to look at the book of Stewards of the Future. Um, and we are stewards of the future of corporations when we sit on a board today. Uh, we are merely helping that particular organisation navigate its way through our current um, uh, situation, our current challenges, our current uh, um, uh, competitive um, uh, environment. So ESG, ethics and sustainability are really about the, um, the stewardship of good governance, okay? Uh, so, uh, and the stewards of the future is available through the Good Governance uh, Library as well, uh, which is, is important for you to have a look at. Uh, and last but not least in session three, we talk about director liability and indemnity precautions and guidelines. You know, how careful do you have to be if you're a director? What should you be looking out for? You know, should you be um, double checking information? Should you have your own legal advisors uh, or just take uh, advice from the in-house counsel of the company whose board you sit on and so forth and so forth. So this becomes a, a, a very practical um, discussion uh, where I try and give some guidelines and give some examples of, of what some successful directors have done with their uh, liability indemnity precautions. And, uh, and I'd like to think that I can leave behind some guidelines uh, for you, uh, for attendees to um, uh, use when they go and select their next board uh, position. So again, session three is over. You go away for a week or so and um, you do some, um, uh, you do some uh, uh, some work. Uh, re predominantly here, we set um, some research around strategic decision making and risk recognition and ESG. They're the three things that we really focus on until we meet again in session four. In session four, um, we then come down a few levels and come down to the uh, on-ground discussion of the difference between managing and governance at board level. I think the best way I can describe my theory of managing and governance at board level um, 
if the board is the driver in a rally car, then um, if, sorry, I'll say, if the management is the driver, then the board is the navigator uh, in a rally car. And that is indeed, um, uh, and that is indeed a challenge. That is indeed a challenge. Uh, because if you have anything to do with uh, rally car driving, if you've ever seen it, if the navigator tries to jump over and try to pl the, m manage the steering wheel of the car, there's nothing surer than the rally car going off the track and into a tree. So um, this becomes a really interesting conversation in session four. This is where I get the most aggravation from directors who say, but we are frustrated with management. And then you have one or two CEOs who are also directors in their other occupation. And they say, well, I've got news for you. I'm a CEO and I get frustrated by my board. So this becomes a really interesting session in that regard. Who frustrates who? And where do you draw the line? So we then go into, having discussed that, we go into understanding guidelines. Each country has their own, uh, um, as the guidelines um, that they require. We in Australia have the uh, recommendations and guidelines of the Australian Stock Exchange, which are eight specific principles. Uh, we have nine specific principles for not-for-profits, um, which are issued by the ACNC. But at the end of the day, in each jurisdiction, we have guidelines. And we talk about the importance of guidelines. So everybody gets to bring up guidelines from their respective country, their respective regions, their respective jurisdictions, and we get to discuss them. This is a great learning experience and understanding how governance has a global network, how governance is not just isolated. You know, governance over here is different. No, it's not. It has different challenges but the principles are basically the same. Duty of care, fiduciary duty, they are global concepts. The business judgment rule that we have in the Corporations Act of Australia is replicated in many legislations across the globe. That duty to have a, make a business judgment that is consistent with the knowledge you have as a director and the information you have before you. So that then takes us into a further legal argument. So as you can see here, we're starting, we went from management and governance, we're moving into uh, the legalities of being a director. We talk about conflict of interest and how do you manage it? Am I allowed to have a conflict of interest? Am I not allowed to have a conflict of interest? Those sorts of questions. And if I have one, how do I manage it? Then the last item on the agenda for session four is disputes and dispute resolution on boards. Now, this came up uh, quite often during my uh, first five years as a um, governance and boardroom consultant, so much so that I went away and did a professional certificate in uh, arbitration and mediation. And um, so that I could help resolve disputes um, on boards. So nowadays, most of my mediations and arbitrations are around uh, boardroom disputes. Uh, and they also, um, I also give expert determinations on disputes. Now, I saw somebody put something about SME directors don't understand the legal obligations. Absolutely. That is absolutely one of the sessions that uh, SMEs um, directors should be attending. And this session is where SME directors really get their eyes open. Uh, they really get their eyes open well and truly here. And they say, I didn't realize I had those sorts of responsibilities. Why wasn't I told? Now, you know, uh, we all have, you know, in Australia, we have the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. We have the Corporations Act. We have the tax office. We have all of those government departments as we have globally that want to keep an eye on what we do and make sure that we perform to our responsibilities. So it's no different for SMEs as it is for large listed companies, as it is for not-for-profits, as it is for sporting associations, 
as it is for foundations, as it is for um, private hospitals and universities. They all have guidelines and principles that they must follow. So this is very much a technical legal session. So session four is where I dust off my legal books and start discussing some legal principles. So we're getting close to the end. Session five, we go away and do some thinking, we do some researching, we do some reading, and we, and we can come back um, and do session five. Session five is, uh, is a bit of a fun domestic exercise. Um, what sort of personality dynamics exist on boards? So uh, in my little um, uh, book, uh, my little um, handbook, I engaged a colleague of mine who's a psychologist and helped her and asked her to help me um, put some labels on the different personalities that uh, work on boards. And uh, she was so kind, of, kind enough to do it for me. And um, we, we ended up coming up with some interesting profiles. And to this day, when I hand out my booklet and when I do a board uh, review or a professional development session, uh, some people are happy to put names of their fellow directors um, uh, along, alongside some of the uh, uh, some of the labels, things like the silent seether, the key influencer, Mister or Mrs. Wonderful, the quiet floater, the silken tongue, the useful old hand, the useless or dead hand, the debater, the pretender, the poltz, the rosy one, the bad advisor. So there's a little bit of fun to be had there and understanding why those personalities exist. So, and I've got one for SMEs too. The arbitrator, the gap filler, the resource, the father confessor, the devil's advocate, the change agent, the image builder, and the corporate networking agent. So we have a bit of fun with that. So, but that's interesting to understand who you're sharing your boardroom with. You know, it's a little bit like the bedroom. You need to be able to understand sleeping with the enemy, so to speak. So what KPIs are critical for a good non-executive director? So that kind of then breaks it down back to this. What KPIs are critical for a good non-executive director? Are critical. So uh, we go through that. And then once we've done that, we prepare ourselves. So this is where you get to do some actual homework. This is where you go back to school. This is where you uh, create an action plan for your future professional development. So where have I, during those four sessions, where did I identify gaps in my own skill set? And what were they? And what do I have to do to fill those gaps? And I don't care if you've been a director, look, I've been a director now for 24 years and I've still got gaps and I teach this stuff. And it frustrates me, but I still feel that I've got room for improvement in certain areas. So if you meet a director that says, I know it all, um, you, you, you really are kidding yourself. Um, so we'll also look at different ways of designing your directorship CV, if you want one, and how to prepare for an interview. And then we're going to do another exercise in session five, which is about making sure that you choose the board you want. Now, this is a challenge because especially for new directors to say, well, I just want to get on a board, any board will do, uh, not necessarily. So we talk about how do you choose your directorship journey so that you end up where you want to end up, not where the journey takes you, okay? So basically the learning outcomes are very simple. Learning outcome number one is what is governance as corporate as a corporate dis discipline and where is it best applied and what imperatives must be observed in the boardroom. Learning outcome two, KPIs and key, sk key skills required to function as an, effective, as an effective director in challenging as well as ordinary times. How to be most effective and efficient. 
learning outcome three, key doctrines and theories that drive good governance in the Western world, and now they can be used to drive leadership in the boardroom. Learning outcome four, driving and owning the relationship between management and the board, the role of the CEO and the role of the chair. And learning outcome five, preparing to enhance your PD as a director in an ever-changing governance environment. So this is where it all ends up. What I'd like to say to you is that undoubtedly, everyone that's done my courses, even the short courses here in Australia, I offer a, um, a four session course. Um, they've all come out of it saying, I've now understood where my learning gaps are, where I need to learn more, where I thought I was pretty sharp, but I am not as sharp as I thought I was in those particular skill sets. And that is definitely one of the key outcomes of this. The other key outcome for me, if I had to break it down to two or three, is that it opens up your mind to want to research more and to question more about what's happening in the boardroom. Because to me, the most valuable question a director on any board in any country could ask is why are we doing this? Why are we taking this approach? And unless you can start with the why and give yourself an answer, the what and the how don't really mean much. So that's why I have a passionate value for this particular course, and I've chosen to take it uh, out into the marketplace globally because I believe that it can make a difference in at least a few boards, one would hope, but one board at a time, I think it can help change attitudes just like many others are trying to. So that's it in a nutshell. I tell you that these sessions are available by Zoom. Um, I've explained to you that there's going to be readings and homework in between the 90 minute to two hour sessions. Every attendee gets a certificate. We offer alternative programs. We've got, this is a five session. I have an eight session and a 12 session program for those who really want to get stuck into it. And for those of you who are really keen and want to do the same course, but in a two and a half day accelerated program, if I can just stop the share, if I may, I'm going to show you something else. Um, is this, uh, is this where I'm carrying the suitcases, Max? Yes, this is where you're yeah. carrying the suitcases. <laughs> um, um, so I'm going to share this screen with you. What I've done with this course, for those of you who are watching still, uh, I've compacted it into two and a half days and I've taken it to Tuscany. So in 2023, now COVID owes me three years worth of this. Uh, so I'm three years behind. But in 2023, on this date, Thursday the 14th of September to Saturday the 6th of September, we will be based in a monastery which has now been turned into a convention centre in Siena, in Tuscany. And we will work for two and a half days in those very same similar subjects, as you can see, right? Very similar subjects, okay? And we will do that uh, nine till four each day with a dinner out where we can get to debate and have chats and, you know, discuss the theories and the philosophies over a glass of Chianti, only to assume study the next day. And on the Saturday, um, we break up with a um, at lunchtime uh, with a uh, visit to a winery and a cooking class. So mm. that's that's mis mixing um, learning with uh, pleasure. But that's more for me than for anybody else. But I, this year, I think I've got a couple of people coming from the UK. I'd love to have some people coming from other parts of the world. So if you're interested, you can always register for that just by going to the website. Uh, but that's that's the course, that's the masterclass for international directors 
in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Max. Wow. Uh, lots of food for thought. I think uh, there's a lot of content in there that's very, very practical. I think it's difficult uh, when you're sitting on, on a board and, you know, we limit the number of boards we sit on, but to actually have this kind of discussion with fellow board members, you feel it's not the right place. So to yeah. be able to have it with you and with other board members where there's no kind of perceived competition, um, I think is is really very useful. So thank you for yeah. that. A yeah. couple of questions. The one is, um, and Patrice, I'm going to I'm going to raise you up to be a panelist so you can ask your question, but. Um, Ozo says over time, uh, uh, over over time, diversity, equity, and inclusivity has been emphasised in management and governance. Is there a recommended transformation or transformative process in place for boards and companies that are deficient in the standard? And um, this is actually quite a, an interesting question, especially given the impact that COVID seems to have had in that most women, um, many women, majority of women, have had to uh, step back a little during lockdown to cater for um, the children, homeschooling, et cetera, that needed to be done. Um, anyway, Ozor carries on, I believe that this course should cover DEI and the transformation of the board, but maybe just some thoughts on your side. Thanks, Max. Yeah, uh, I think it's important. I think, you know, um, diversity and um, uh, and, uh, and, and equity in, in, and inclusivity in, on the board are, are, are key. Uh, and, and I often say this, look, I mean, I don't know if there was anybody here from the mining industry, but here in Australia, we've got mining companies galore, right? Like you have in South Africa. I think South Africa has as, much, as a bigger mining industry as we have, if not bigger. And, 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 and the, the, the challenge is that we mine in different communities, we mine in different countries, but we make no effort to put board members on our board that understand those communities culturally, ethnically, and politically, right? So if I'm going to go around digging holes in, in South America, you know, it would pay for me to have a, a board member who understands South American politics, South American culture, South American, and so forth. And then, you know, if, if you're in the health services and you, you're, you know, providing health services to, to, to a particular gender, well, you know, you need to be understanding. We, we tend to, and, you know, here I am, look at me, uh, and I use this as a, as, a, as, a, as a way of stirring conversation when I do presentations. We tend to have pale, stale males everywhere, right? <laughs> Uh, and, 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 you know, I'm probably one of them. Here I am, pale, style male, right? Um, but the point is we've got to be careful of that because I, I just don't believe that we're doing diversity, equity and inclusivity, inclusivity so well that we can afford to just act casually about it. Mm. Doesn't it take more time then in a boardroom to kind of come to consensus because you've got these polarizing views what what is your sense of that yeah uh, look i recently worked with one where i had you know i had uh, uh, uh for those who are from the uk i had dad's army at one end and i had the new younger brigade at the other and um and and it was it was hard it was hard work it was like dragging a, an elephant to 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 the dance floor it was just mm. not not happening it was just not happening and um and and, but it's got to be pers persistence and consistently asking the question, are we diverse? Are we equity bound? Do we include everybody that we should include? And, it's, and, and I think it's, a, it, it's, it's almost like a water torture type approach. Mm -hmm. There's no, no magic, you know. Um, you've got to highlight you know, the opportunity gaps that will not be filled unless you go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And I guess you're going to have to have a very good chair to be able to get that discussion happening because I do see in some boards where you've got, um, you, you know, those the dad's army actually uh, become quiet and don't want to participate in the discussion, even though they've yeah. got very strong opinions. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, there's, you know, you know, you might not believe this, but, you know, in the, in the, in the 20 odd years that I've been doing this, um, there's bullying on boards, yeah. right? 
there are there is bullying, and it just and it's or sometimes it's done with eye contact. It's nothing physical. There's nothing verbal. It's just eye contact. You know, mm. they look across mm. the table and say, "Don't you say a thing? Don't you dare say a thing!" Right? Mm. And mm. and mm. and and I think you've got to destroy that, and that takes strong leadership. Like, mm. for instance, I have a philosophy that a board chair should never sit at the head of the table. We're not going out to dinner. Nobody's going to pay the bill. Right? <laughs> Yes. Okay, so if you want to be a good chair, you sit at the middle of the, you, you uh, just picture an oval table or a rectangular table, right? You mm. sit on either side of the table, but in the middle mm. as a chair, right? Mm. You put the treasurer on one side because you need to refer to the numbers, right? Mm. And you put your minute taker on your the other side. Mm. Well, you put them left or right, right or left, it's entirely up to you. But I don't think a chair should sit at the head of the table. Right. Leadership yeah. is not defined by the position you sit at. Mm. Leadership is not defined by the name tag that says team leader, right? Mm. It's not mm. defined by the colour of your, of your hair, you know, grey hair, bald, or wish I was, I've got both, but, you know, bald and grey, <laughs> right? Um, it's not defined by any of that. It's defined by what you say the moment you open your mouth, mm. Mm. right? And... Barack Obama has never sat at the head, the, head, the head of any table. If you notice, if you notice some of the, the the YouTube videos of Barack Obama at meetings, very rarely he sits at the head of the table. Mm -hmm. Right? He it likes to sit in a circle. Yeah. Quiet leadership. Quiet leadership. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. to be said from leading from behind. You know, mm -hmm. the little boulder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that that's. Very, very interesting. So it's almost like we're going to have to really work on on the chairs of boards to get to get them more equipped to dealing with diversity, equity, and inclusivity to be able yep. to deal with those personalities. And yeah, given the world, the way the world is going today, uh, both you know you, we see it in 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 the political arena, and we'll see it in the boardrooms. We need stronger leadership. We need people who believe in the right way of doing things and are willing to push it and to persist. Resilience is what lacks a lot of the time. If it gets too hard, they pull back. Mm -hmm. The other problem is that you have chairs that have been chairs for 15 years. I don't know about the other countries that I'm speaking to today, whether you've experienced it, but I know full well I can name a dozen companies in Australia who've had the same chairman for 17, 18 years. Mm. Mm. Amazing. You know, you can't tell me that that's going to bring up new ways of thinking. Mm -mm. Gets a bit stale. I see so this question on. from Patrice. And unfortunately, Patrice can't come on live, but he's saying, in his opinion, uh, optimal size for a board is about seven, two executive directors, five non-executive directors. That's in a unitary board. Um, what What is your sense of that, Max? Well, he's, he's spot on because my favourite size is between six and nine, right? Okay. So about seven's good. I like an odd number because that way it does away with the chair having to uh, exercise their executive mm. vote. Casting, uh, yeah. Yeah, the casting vote. So at the end of the day, an odd number is always a good number. Uh, you know, as I said to you, I have a client who often keeps on reminding me that the, a board of one is always the best kind of board. Um, but... But we don't live in that kind of world just yet. Uh, but, you know, I think seven's a good number. Seven's a good number. Mm. Nine's a good number. Five, a bit skinny, depending on the size mm. of the organisation. I I facilitated a workshop with a board with 18 people on it. One it eight. One eight. Yeah. Okay. And I went and, and, and I dreaded walking into that room when I was driving to the venue where they were holding this, um, this full day professional development day and strategic planning mm. day I was dreading because I I wanted to say something but I didn't want to offend anybody uh, but I thought how can there be 18 people making decisions this organization is mm. not big enough to even warrant such a you know even if, mm. if, they, if the organization mm. needed subcommittees galore it was it mm. was the organization turned over less than 100 million Hmm. Talking about that, what, what about member elected board members? So in the case of, 
of funds, um, your pension fund schemes, yeah. there's member mutuals, and yeah. mutuals. Um, also, in the case of, of um, professional bodies, there's member elected directors. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, you know, it, it, that's a bit of a popularity contest. How do you make sure yeah. that the people who end up on the board are actually equipped to be on the board and and is that a problem do you see that as a common problem or, or it's a common that? problem it's a common problem okay. i have suggested some alternative ways of preventing that is by making people aware before they put their hand up to be voted in of what their duties are all about so give them a, mm. a one-page job description this is our expectations of you should you be lucky enough to win the election okay okay I was really I, expected. Yeah, I sit on a board where we're we uh, the the members of my board are elected, are elected by the 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 membership base, and I've used that technique. And in the past five years, I've had three withdrawals. Okay, so people actually okay. recognise that they, the, they the look at the list and say, "Yeah, you want me to do all this? Yeah, oh, maybe I shouldn't have nominated." Yeah, you yeah. might get lucky, okay. but. You know, uh, the other thing is remember that knowledge is like boiling a frog, right? Mm -hmm. Eventually, as your knowledge gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, and hotter, and hotter you're going to have people walk away from the boardroom, yeah. right? Yeah. The yeah. more professional your board becomes, the harder it is to live in it if you're not willing to step up to that professionalism. Right. So... You know, uh, the survival of the fittest, the Darwinian theory comes into play, right? Eventually, mm. people will fade off. But yes. in order to do that, you need to have a board that is willing to lift the standard each and every year, so to speak, yeah. right? So when you join that board, either you're sharp or you're out. So my yeah. favourite saying is you soon, you've got to make sure that people are tuned in or tuned out. If they're tuned out, they've got to go on their, they're on their way out. Mm. They've got to stay tuned in. To it stay means in. that you need an effective mechanism that's already agreed to, to tune them out, to yep. actually move, move out, you know, those yep. who are not contributing. So yep. that Where they look at it and say, look, I'm, you know, here I am, you know, I am overweight, um, uh, wrong shape, and I'm trying to play, um, you know, rugby for the for for, for the national oh, side. No, sorry, the wrong country. Blacks. <laughs> wrong, all blacks. Oh, God forbid, they don't play rugby. Um, you know, for the, <laughs> yeah, for, you know. So um, that's the the thing, right? So um, mm. you, you you've got to be fit for purpose. Yeah, it's really, it, it's as it's as blunt as that. You've got to Max, be fit for purpose. This time has gone. I don't know where it's gone, but it's been so interesting. I've, uh, we've got three minutes left, and there's a quick question here from Morocco. Uh, just a quick one. Failure of governance seemed to be the main cause of corporate collapse. And based on your experience, do you think the way companies appoint their directors can assist in screening possible characters who are prone to being unethical and end up collapsing the organization? Is there a method that you can use to detect uh, or preventively um, not let them come into the into on, onto the board. Is is there such a mechanism? Do you think? Well, uh, that's a good question. Where, where is that question come from? Uh, Morocco. Uh, uh, where are you from, Morocco? Where's Morocco? Oh, okay. I don't. I don't know. Right. I'm going to well, here in, here in Australia yeah. this year, we've just introduced a, in a, the. And it elapses tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last day for registration. Your director identification number, which then oh. leads to a, a registry which gives us a history of who you are and where you've been as a director. So oh. we've done that in Australia because we've had directors who have been involved with collapsed organisations and then popped up as directors somewhere else. You know, mm. uh, and expounding their their knowledge and their success, and you know, I was on the board of so and so. Little do people know that so and so went to liquidation because of directors like them. So the first thing is, yes, there's got to be a registration system in your country. Two, um, I think uh, uh, stop reference checking directors with the references they give you. 
Um, okay. Reference check them with the people they've interacted with rather than the references right. they give you. Here's okay, another one. Another We've one. got one minute. Yes, um, kindly comment on this one. I was recently appointed a an employee member trustee, but based in a remote office and majority of the board members are based in the city. I'm struggling to fitting in because most of the meetings are virtual and I miss a lot from the physical meetings. Please advise. Well, um, I would try and see if you can attend mm. the meetings at least you know, if there's 10 meetings in a year, attend at least four or five in, yeah. in, in persona. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, that is difficult. That is difficult. And I need yeah. COVID tested that. Um, the other thing you could do is have phone hookups. Just ring the other directors and talk to them over the phone. They have an over-the-phone mm. coffee conversation. Do you know, uh, I've Happy sold day. many a many a yeah, I have I have sold many a board and avoided many a board catastrophe over a coffee. Mm. Unfortunately, Thanks not so on the golf Matt. course, but over a coffee. Um, <laughs> we are out of time. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. This is on it was live streamed to YouTube. The video will be placed on the web page so everyone can access it afterwards. Your brochure and the slides that you showed now are on the website as well as that offer to, to join, can I say us? Because um, I'm going to be carrying your bags. <laughs> <laughs> to, to join the team and trust me. Sounds yeah, wonderful. Absolutely. Well, yeah, look, I'd love to see some, some, some international faces there. Um, so look forward to it. Um, it's not a big group. Uh, it can't go over 15. Uh, so it's only 15. Uh, because any more than 15 just gets too confusing and we don't cover mm. the two and a half days then become too difficult. Uh, so it's a, it's a select group of up to 15 and we have a really good time and, and, it's, and it's really interactive. So ask someone for a Christmas prezi. <laughs> Thanks so much, yeah, everyone. Right. Thank Especially you. That you're, 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 most of you are luckier than I am. I'm in Australia on the other side of the globe. Uh, it's the most expensive. It's the most expensive trip to to Europe is from Australia. Ah, yeah. It, All right. I better say goodbye to everybody. All right. All thank right. you thank so you much for much. attending. Thank, no, thank, thank you, Max. You. And we'll see you in the next webinar. Okay. okay. Thank Bye. you, everybody. And if you need to contact me, 